Today, I'm going to talk to you about genetic bottlenecks and a concept called adaptive radiation, both of which are very much related to our previous topic of uh, natural selection. <clears throat> so a genetic bottleneck is an interesting phenomenon that occurs at times. Uh, basically, what happens is uh, some sort of crisis occurs, like maybe a fire or uh, you know, like the comet that killed all the dinosaurs, or uh, maybe it's a drought or a disease, but something takes the population that has a normally high level of genetic variation, genetic biodiversity. And then what happens is the population size crashes almost to zero. It almost goes extinct. And this limits the amount of genetic uh, biodiversity you can have because there's just a few members left. So we take it to a very small, limited number of individuals, but they survive the, 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 the cataclysm. And then what happens is afterwards, you know, they'll reproduce and their numbers will come back up. So you can, you can generate new members fairly quickly. Right, you know, whatever your generational time frame is, but but getting new genetic biodiversity is not going to happen except through random mutations and natural selection. So it can take much, 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 much longer for that genetic biodiversity to return. So what happens then is having a lot of genetic biodiversity. Why did these ones survive and all the other ones didn't? Well, they were in part they're lucky, but they could also be because they were genetically better suited to whatever that calamity was. Let's say it was a drought. They were just genetically slightly more able to survive without dying of thirst than the other members of their of their group that did not have that same genetic component. Uh, and so what happens is now there's there's no you know, there, 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 we're, we're 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 much reduced in the genes that we have. So in this new population, if another calamity happens, but it's not a drought, it's something different, they may not be genetically equipped to have enough variation to survive it, and they may go to extinction. So if, if a bottleneck is strong enough, like if you limit the population so much, then what happens is, is, is even worse, because then what happens is you get inbreeding. So inbreeding uh, is, is why Every human culture has taboos against marrying within families because inbreeding is likely to occur. So inbreeding happens when um, individuals are mating with close relatives, like siblings, or 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 maybe uh, you know one generation removed. And so what, what that what this does is there are alleles that are you know so so variants of genes you know so so without getting too much into detail. You know, each of us get two copies of a gene, one from our mother and one from our father, and one of them expresses itself and the other one typically does not. And so what happens is often the ones that cause problems don't get expressed. They're just carried as a recessive gene. They're present, but they're not expressed. So so they, they don't they don't cause you a problem. But the problem is if if you get two copies of the uh, recessive gene that has a problem, you don't have a backup copy, you're going to have whatever that problem is. So what we find then is in inbred populations, you greatly increase the, the odds that individuals will inherit two copies of this flawed allele or this gene variant that's going to cause a genetic disorder. And, and that happens then, we just notice the whole population tends to be you know, suffering from whatever this genetic disorder is. So let's just look at a couple examples. No one is really sure exactly what happened, but 12,000 years ago, apparently, uh, some bottleneck happened with the cheetah population in Africa. Apparently, the population came really, really, really close to extinction uh, to where members were having to breed uh, with siblings. And uh, although the, the, the population came back, the genetic biodiversity is so, so low. So there's a couple of problems. One is uh, that there's this defective gene that, that greatly reduces the amount of sperm that the male cheetahs produce. So it's very difficult for them to get their numbers up. Uh, but another thing that's kind of interesting is they're so genetically similar to each other that you can take like a liver out of one cheetah, put it in another one, and it won't get it won't get rejected. You know, normally that doesn't want something you could do with siblings, but they're basically so genetically similar that they're like siblings to each other. But they have but so that's just how genetically similar they are as a result. That's that is an indication of how the bottleneck made a a very low amount of genetic biodiversity as a consequence. But the the genetic disorders are a consequence of that inbreeding problem. And here's another one you won't believe. Oh, I, I will do this one first, okay? So in Europe, you had um, nobility felt like they were better than everybody else and they wanted to control power, so they would marry within families. So basically, in different European countries, you know, the, the people who were in charge, the, the nobility there, were all related to each other. They were all like first cousins, and they kept... They, they kept they kept marrying each other to retain power. Well, as a result of this, this inbreeding greatly reduced genetic uh, biodiversity and increased the likelihood of, of certain um, uh, 
problem gene variants alleles from being present in people so they you found people had hemophilia which is like a, a lack of blood clotting factors so a little cut caused you to bleed to death it made for a lot of the women had a hard time conceiving or carrying babies to term people had this weird thing called porphyria where their, their, their urine had a blue tinge to it and it caused them to 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 uh have it uh mental disturbances. And then of course, there's the famous Habsburg chin. You look at these paintings, it's not that the artists weren't good artists, it's that the people had a genetic disorder as a consequence of, of inbreeding. Well, then there's a thing called the founder effect. So the founder effect is a, is a type of genetic bottleneck that, that's caused by migration. So what happens is, imagine we have a population with a lot of genetic diversity. These blue things just represent different genes. But a small number of the population travel someplace else, say to an island or you know a remote valley somewhere, and they, they, they start a new population, they start breeding, make a new population. Well, I had a lot of genetic biodiversity here, but I don't here. And so although the population can grow <clears throat> at the rate of whatever the species reproduces, you can't get new genetic biodiversity. So the biodiversity remains very low. And so we see this a lot on, on when islands especially uh, get colonized by birds or, or animals that wash out. We'll talk about that in, a, in another class. Uh, but it, it, tend, it leads to this, this, this uh, low genetic biodiversity. Now, look at this. This is for real, okay? There's a great example of the human founder effect. All right, so what happened was there's this family that they call the Blue Fugits, okay? So Martin Fugit and his wife moved to Kentucky in 1820, and they both carried a recessive gene. So they, they, they weren't blue, but they carried this recessive gene that, 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 that causes a, um, a blood disorder called uh, methoglobinemia. And, 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 and if you have two copies of this gene variant, uh, the, you know, two of these alleles, you're going to end up with blue skin and, and a few health concerns, but you live to adulthood and be able to reproduce. So what happened was, over time, this community just had so much of those genes present because it was a very small, like isolated community in the a remote part of the Kentucky mountains that for, for a number of generations, it was very common to see blue people in this one valley. Weird, but true. Dog breeders often have to try to go to, uh, uh, they, they give thought to how to increase the genetic biodiversity of their population because what happens is they tend to inbreed. So if there's a, a particular dog that, or in this house, horses, or any kind of animals that we're breeding, there, there's tend to be one that's like a champion. Everyone wants to have that one. So they tend to breed that one a lot. And what happens is by limiting the, the, the gene pool, by, by breeding certain dogs with certain dogs, then you, you greatly reduce the amount of genetic biodiversity and you end up having, you know, close relatives breeding with each other. And as a consequence, these, these problem alleles tend, these that are normally recessive, become present in both, you know, the, the both both sets of, of genes that, that uh, both, both sets of chromosomes that the baby inherits or puppy inherits will have this problem. And so you'll end up then with things like hip dysplasia or, the, you know, a lot of times these, these purebred dogs have mental problems, emotional problems. Whereas mutts, dogs that haven't been bred particularly, they have a much, much greater genetic biodiversity. They tend not to have all these problems. They, they don't look as pretty. Uh, they, you know, they don't look like a champion dog, but, but they don't have hip dysplasia or mental issues. Okay, now let's real briefly talk about what's called an endemic species. An endemic species is one that is found in one particular place. Uh, so, you know, so we say that like, like this is endemic to this place. Okay, so an endemic species is one that is found just like in one island or one forest or one mountain. Okay, so it's in one part of the world. It could be a continent, but usually it's a smaller region than that. Uh, and generally speaking, they're very highly adapted to a particular niche that was available wherever they are. And, and because of that, because they are often uh, evolved to be specific to a particular niche, if something happens to that niche, so say, say it's like a bird that only eats one kind of plant, if that plant goes extinct, the bird goes extinct. And so, so uh, let's just talk real quickly about how this endemism happens. So first of all, a couple of examples that you might be familiar with, the giant tortoise of the Galapagos Islands, only found there. Uh, different islands have different tortoises because they, they don't swim, okay? Uh, now, how they got there, we don't really know, but but, but what we found is that when people got there, they brought things with them, and they, they, they introduced some species. We'll talk about that later in the unit. They brought rats and goats and pigs, and those those competed with the tortoises for food, and the tortoise population was dropping. Uh, people intervened and were able to save them, but, but the only place you find these giant tortoises is the Galapagos Islands. That makes them an endemic species. A, a continent-wide one would be the platypus, which is found in Eastern Australia. Again, it's only found there, it's not found anywhere else in the world. That's true of a lot of things in Australia, 
uh, because it's so isolated uh, by the ocean. Um, and then there's Tarsiers. Look at that guy. It's so adorable. Okay, so it's uh, the world's smallest primate. It's only found on uh, the island of Bohol uh, in the Philippine uh, Visaya archipelago. So it's, it just is unique to this one area, which of course makes it very vulnerable, right? If something happens to that one area, there aren't other places that where it exists. So there, these endemic species are far more likely to uh, go extinct than other species. Most of the extinctions that happen in the world are to endemic species. Now, adaptive radiation is the last thing I want to talk about, and it's related to this. So adaptive radiation basically means when, when, when you, you basically have a, a, a small population arrive somewhere, uh, like, uh, say, on an island, or say that uh, something happens and wipes out a lot, like the, when dinosaurs are wiped out, you basically have a lot of available niches that aren't filled. So normally, evolution doesn't doesn't allow new species to form because you know if I have an adaptation that makes me e able to eat nuts, well, there's already something there that's eating those nuts, and so like I I just died, okay. But if you kill a thing that eats those nuts, and I and I evolve in a way that makes me have teeth that lets me eat those nuts, then I'm going to move into that niche. And so what we find is with adaptive radiation is you'll have these explosions of new speciation events. So so lots of new species will form in order to fill those available niches. Now it takes time because it's it's, it's uh, evolution it takes a while, but but we find this a lot. Uh, so so for instance, um, uh, well let's try this here. Okay, so so. Uh, when when the comet killed the dinosaurs, all those niches they were filling gone. Okay, and and at the time, mammals were just this kind of little side thing, this weird little mouse-like creature, and that one little mouse-like creature filled almost every available niche afterwards. So take a look. So this one little insectivore, it it, it evolved over time to fill, you know, flying and eating insects and fruits, jumping in trees, you know, uh, bouncing around, digging. Uh, uh, swimming in the ocean you know, and, and eating squid, swimming in the ocean and eating plankton, running around. And you know, so basically all these different um, uh, niches were filled by the evolution of this one little insectivore that over time gave rise to all these other ones. So we call that adaptive radiation. This one radiated to fill all those other niches. Now, adaptive radiation is responsible for the high rate of endemism we find on islands because what typically happens is you have this small population of organisms that ends up on the island and the island isn't really occupied so there's all these available niches and so over time evolution is going to do its thing and it, the, the the descendants of those initial colonizing founders will radiate through through natural selection to fill those those niches if there's a way to survive it will get filled through evolution so you end up with these species that only exist on that one island that's how the galapagos turtle ended up there now, the thing is, so you look at islands like Hawaii and lots of ones in the Pacific, they often, before humans arrived at least, were completely endemic. Like 90% or more of the species are only found on that island, okay? Uh, but they don't have a lot of, 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 of richness, so there's not a lot of species there. But what species that are there are unique to that place. So it's not that they have high biodiversity, but they have high amounts of endemism, of, of, of species that are unique to that location. Uh, but endemism also occurs in, in, in tropical rainforests for different reasons. So in a tropical rainforest, there's all these niches available, but they're stable. And there's a lot of time and there's a lot of genes out there. So there's a lot of genetic biodiversity. So evolution has an opportunity to end up uh, evolving creatures that are suited to fill what we call a sub-niche. So like, like they're, they're highly adapted to one specific part of the ecosystem. Uh, and we, we tend to find this a lot in rainforest because they're very stable. There's a lot of productivity, so there's lots of life possible, and there's a lot of time for this to happen. So we end up with, with these very specific symbiotic relationships and other types of, of sub-niche type um, uh, evolved species. Okay, so that was this topic. I'll see you later.